Good morning, everyone. While we wait for other participants to join our session, allow us to show you a short video about the Farmer to Farmer program. Good morning and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our fourth installment of our Farmer to Farmer Knowledge Sharing Webinar. Um, my name is Christine Violago. I currently serve as the Country Manager of the Philippine Office of Grameen Foundation and will serve this as the moderator for today's event. Before we begin, we'd like to share about Grameen and who we are as an organization and our objectives. We are um, an international nonprofit organization whose mission is to enable the poor, especially women, to end poverty and hunger. And how do we do this? So we work in three breakthrough areas. The first is in digital financial services. The second is in digital innovations for agriculture. And the third is in um, community agents and health financing access. In July 2019, Grameen Foundation was granted the opportunity to implement the capacity building of the coconut subsector program through Farmer to Farmer. It is a USAID funded initiative that promotes technical assistance in developing countries. Farmer to Farmer capacity building of the coconut subsector, also known as F2F COCOS, is a volunteer technical assistance program aim to increase the coconut sector's productivity, profitability, and access or expanding access to financial services. In today's knowledge sharing webinar, we have these different goals. The first one is to share experiences of our farmer to farmer volunteer, Susan Gurley and Johnny Ramos and our host partner friend foundation represented by their executive manager or executive director manager, Christina Darling Bulaon. They will highlight some takeaways on preparing strategic and operational plans for our organizations serving micro or small entrepreneurs. Second, we want to promote and collaborate between stakeholders, volunteers towards the attainment of resilience within the coconut subsector. We are glad to have participants from different industries 
We also have representatives from the private sector today, local and international non-government organizations, the academe, and representatives from USAID and the Partners of the Americas, recognized uh, participants also from um, USAID, I believe, um, let me see if some folks are here in the call. Um, later on, we will recognize them. And today, we are also joined by representatives by, from Grameen Foundation. Um, we'll start off with Judith Agnoletto, our country director for the Farmer to Farmer Focus. She will be briefly presenting about the Farmer to Farmer program. And we also have Sabrina Karashi, our program director of the Bankers Without Borders, who will facilitate our discussion today. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few housekeeping reminders for everyone. The duration of this program is one hour and a third, about 30 minutes extra for Q&A. So please be mindful of the time since some of our participants are in different time zones. English is not the first language of some of our participants. So when you are speaking, kindly, clearly, and slowly um, uh, speak and present your views and our team can translate and uh, help translate when necessary. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to all participants. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we will address them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. After the webinar, we will also be sharing with you the names and contact information of all participants. Thank you and welcome to our webinar session. And now I give the microphone to Judith to present about Farmer to Farmer. Judith? Thank you so much, Christine. Hello, everyone. My name is Judith Agnoletto. So I am the Grameen Foundation's country director of the F2F COCOS. This is being implemented in the Philippines. Welcome, everyone. So I'm happy to have uh, different participants from different parts of the world. <laughs> so today, we will be sharing you an example of how farmer-to-farmer -farmer capacity building of the coconut subsector works in generating sustainable broad-based economic growth in the agricultural sector through expert and dedicated volunteers. Organizations serving smallholder farmers with their identified technical needs are trained or mentored or advised in achieving certain results. F2F volunteer experts, on the other hand, are given the opportunity to understand better the de de development issues and programs that, that they may share with their own communities. The COVID-19 pandemic didn't stop us with F2F mission. Instead, the more does strengthen its commitment. U.S. volunteers work remotely, alone, or with a local volunteer counterpart, as in the case of our featured volunteers today. It is likewise difficult during these times for organizations to engage in numerous activities, but the threat of a possible further decline makes organizations try even harder to take this rare opportunity of working with F2F volunteer experts. So in the past couple of years, the program serves various organizations in the Philippines, particularly in areas with large um, coconut farming communities, such as in southern Luzon, in Bicol, eastern Visayas, and many parts of Mindanao, including Friend Foundation that we have today. Most of these organizations suffered a significant decline in their gross income, unfortunately, and as expected. They are really striving hard first to protect their staff and businesses, surviving both health and economic crisis. In this time, F2F has become more significant in fact. We didn't go away, we didn't leave our mission. Some of the technical assistance done and, are, and ongo ongoing are uh, e-commerce, for example, uh, farmer profiling, market research, business and strategic planning, as, as what we are featuring today, marketing and promotion, product development also, and many others. Examples of results include streamlined risk management processes, especially those with uh, financial services for smallholder farmers, 
improved organizational management practices, define product profile, and also improve the quality of their product, better e-commerce strategies, and of course, more confident management and staff all leading to more resilient cooperatives, agribusinesses, or other institutions. So in today's knowledge sharing, we hope that we can provide you better insights and also valuable understanding of what's happening into our communities of smallholder farmers. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining. So back to you, Christine. Thank you, Judith, for sharing about the Farmer to Farmer program. For those who are interested to learn more about our program, we are happy to share the details after the webinar. And now I give the floor to Sabrina, who will lead the panel discussion for our session. Sabrina, take it away. Thank you. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sabrina Qureshi, and I'm the director of Bankers Without Borders here in Washington, D.C., and also the global director for the Farmer to Farmer Cocos program of Grameen Foundation. A little bit more about Bankers Without Borders. We were established 13 years ago as Grameen Foundation's uh, global volunteer effort, really leveraging on the pro bono uh, corporate sector support and individual volunteers from around the world, providing pro bono support in Grameen Foundation's mission of eradicating world poverty and hunger. So fast forward, you know, 13 years, I'm proud to say we have over 25,000 volunteers now from 170 countries represented. And not just bankers, so they're coming with varied skill set from finance, business consulting, marketing, HR, m and &E, technology, and what have you, who are providing pro bono support to over 300 social enterprises in 50 countries. There is some for everyone. So some of these engagements are short term, virtual. Sometimes they're on the ground as in the farmer to farmer engagement, sometimes a mix of virtual and on ground engagement. So if you haven't checked us out, I would say please do check us out at bankerswithoutborders.com. You can either become a volunteer or request uh, pro bono support for if you are an organization. So now without further ado, I will invite our three panelists to join in our discussion. Our first panelist is Christina Blau, known to friends as Darling, um, Chief Executive Officer of Foundation for Rural and Industrial Equipment for National Development, um, or also referred as Friend Foundation. Darling will tell us about Friend Foundation and talk also about the support she received research recently from the Farmer to Farmer program. Ma'am Darling, on to you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Ms. Sabrina. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to those in the Philippines and good evening to those in the rest of the world. At the outset, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to the Grameen Foundation for this opportunity to introduce our organization in this prestigious forum and to share how they have supported and assisted us to move on after an unforeseen experience that affected us tremendously. In 2015, Friend was serving more than 50,000 microfinance clients in 11 provinces of Mindanao. From its humble beginnings in 2002, as a training and corporate social responsibility arm of the People's Bank of Caraga, we offered various courses on financial literacy, entrepreneurship, values, healthcare, disaster risk reduction management, good agricultural practices, and many le uh, lecture demonstrations on various income generating projects. And these were given mostly to women and smallholder farmers. But in 2017, PBC felt the impact of frequent typhoons to the microfinance and smallholder farmer clients who, for a considerable period, failed to pay their obligations, resulting to high past dues. This left the bank in serious difficulty. 
to save the bank and hoping that clients and employees will be secured, the bank was forced to sell in 2019. However, the new management did not want to provide non-financial and microfinance services. Friends' role was likewise terminated after 17 years. We then had to take on a new direction as an independent organization, a turning point which we were not totally prepared for. Grameen's F2F project came when Friend needed it most. So far, three volunteer assistance projects were accorded to Friend. The first engagement was with Ms. Jelan Richardson Roche. It aimed to comprehensively evaluate Friend's resources and capacities. This was conducted through two week face to face sessions in February 2020. Friend's vision, mission, and value statements were revised as we transformed into a social enterprise development NGO. We were trained to strengthen our knowledge on management and strategic planning. This also resulted to a new sister microfinance organization. One of the interesting outputs of this engagement was the story of friend in pictures, which allowed us to dig deeper into our organizational identity. Having decided to transform into a social enterprise development NGO, it was recommended that we capacitate our staff on community development processes, approaches, and tools. We were trained by F2F volunteer Ms. Sonia Hansen, a graduate student at Stanford University in the latter months of 2020. She facilitated five webinars on goal setting, strategy selection, and information gathering techniques and other related topics. An output from these sessions is a data collection tool for administration to program beneficiaries. We were also encouraged to organize steering committees in the communities we would wanted to serve. And they will be composed of leaders from various sectors, and leaders from prospective beneficiaries. And because of both from Ms. Jalan and Ms. Sonia's advice, we started developing our website, something they strongly recommend if we were to transition into an organization that is open to all, including prospective supporters and funders. Finally, this year, we received the third volunteer assignment for friends strategic planning with U.S. volunteer Ms. Susan Gurley and local counterpart Mr. Johnny Ramos. We reviewed and improved our vision, mission, and value statements, then developed program areas with corresponding goals and strategies for specific targets and activities. Virtual sessions on the details of strategic planning were facilitated by Ms. Susan Gurley while Mr. Ramos facilitated face-to-face -face sessions on how to implement components of the strategic plan. With their help, we now have an enhanced vision, mission, and value statements and plans with a comprehensive budget with corresponding footnotes for each program area. And we were trained on using the business model canvas and received inputs to our website development. We still have a lot to do, but behind all the hard work and knowing that we are not alone, we now feel more confident in continuing our service to the marginalized communities in our region. We will continue learning and sharing what we have. Pandemic or not, we should be all right. Thank you ever so much, and God bless us all. Thank you, darling, for this detailed background on Friend Foundation and the various volunteer support you have received from farmer to farmer uh, in these past years. Now I will invite our second panelist, Johnny Ramos, an expert in agritourism, 
supply chain analysis, rural systems development, and training and facilitation. Connie holds a national certificate of organic agriculturist from the Philippines government and is an agriculturist for Barobo Surigao del Sur. You will hear from Johnny on his on-ground farmer-to-farmer -farmer engagement with friend in the Philippines and what he aspires for the organization he served. Johnny. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Bankers Without Borders and German Foundation. It is such a privilege for having me here. When I found out that the F2F caucus is in need of a volunteer for Friend Foundation, I immediately took the liberty of uh, submitting my application as it will be the opportunity for me to help my hometown, San Francisco, and San Francisco. Allow me to share with you a few of the takeaways I have had during the stint of my volunteer work with the Friend Foundation. I have collated uh, here the replicable success factors and uh, organized them uh, into an acronym FRIEND for uh, easier recall. First, uh, F. F for forging multiple partnerships. For Friend Foundation to successfully further its uh, existence, it has multiple uh, partnerships, engaging as many stakeholders as it can. I suggest that uh, they keep the four-in-one formula in multi-partner uh, multi uh, arrangements. Uh, this is uh, when forging partnerships, it would be great to involve at least a national government agency, a local government unit, a civil society organization, and a business or private sector. This is to balance the participation and, of course, uh, to engage as many participants uh, for um, more resources. Then, R for our readiness to learn new things and processes. The whole team of uh, Friend Foundation had indeed proven that our minds are like parachutes. Our minds work well when they're open. For the Friend team, the conceptualization of new projects and approaches seems like a normal thing. This is largely due to their openness of their minds. The next is I for uh, innovativeness from indigency. Innovation doesn't need to be expensive. The friend team had revived their uh, indigenous connection to the communities and the intent to use it on propelling their uh, social enterprise and uh, agritourism. In fact, the involvement of indigenous peoples is uh, on a high note. Uh, with them. The fourth is uh, E for uh, environmentally sound policies and practices. As a quote says, we only borrow this uh, planet from future generations. Thus, we ensure that all the programs and projects under the strategic plan of Friend Foundation is compliant with all the environmental guidelines and policy. The next one is N for next normal mindset via digital aptitude. One of the positive impacts of the pandemic is the increase of digital knowledge and virtual connectivity among adults. This had also become the mantra of the friend team to continue and even level up their digital and uh, virtual ways of doing things. As we speak, they are indeed actively virtually connected. And lastly, D for devolution of social awareness and action. It is my constant reminder that in doing social awareness and action, one doesn't have to do it alone. Despite the government imposed restrictions, 
communities are still opening the opportunities for volunteerism. Thus, let us not hesitate to devolve our values, social advocacies, and actions through them. It is on these factors that Friend Foundation is basically thriving and doing its best, and that other organizations can freely emulate their impactful practices. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Johnny, for this exhaustive list of success factors, even matching the organization's name. Uh, so easy to remember recommendations, which I'm sure are not only useful to Friend Foundation, but to others on, the, on today's call. I'm gonna invite now our third panelist, Susan Gurley, a veteran US volunteer who has recently won the Volunteer of the Year Award during the 35th anniversary of Farmer to Farmer program. Susan is a doctor in law, uh, an entrepreneur, and has years of experience in capacity building, strategic planning, program design and development. She is bold, innovative, and passionate about helping struggling organizations. So I'll now invite Susan to tell us more about her Farmer to Farmer engagement. Um, first of all, I would like to thank everybody for this opportunity. And I currently run a nonprofit in the United States, and today is Giving Tuesday. So for me to be able to do this is in line of what we're doing, which is to ensure that nonprofits like Friends can be sustainable and ensure that they can help the stakeholders and that they can communicate to the stakeholders and to funders, because let's remember, for a nonprofit to survive, we need money. And one of the things that I enjoyed working with Christina and her team, and I'd like to stress her team because she runs a wonderful team. Every one of her staff people was as engaged as Christina, and that was a joy for me. So nobody cares about strategic planning. Let's be honest, you're probably going, oh, for God's sakes, it is so boring. Capacity building is boring. Data analysis is boring. But having a strategic plan, believe it or not, is the backbone for your survival and for you to be able to articulate what you're trying to achieve. And strategic planning is tedious. It is dull but it is critical. So the first question I ask all of, and we have to do footnotes, of course. Um, the first question I always ask a partner organization is, if you didn't exist anymore, who would care? Would anybody notice if you were no longer here? And that is the most critical question. And I have to say friends answered it very clearly. If they no longer existed, it would cause irreputable harm. So that was a question you start out with. And I think, Christina, you were able to answer that, right? Why do we not, if, if you disappeared, what would happen? Christina, what would happen if you didn't well, exist anymore? We, we, were, we were already exposed to a lot of people in our own community. So if we disappear, they will wonder why. And, they will feel. And people would, would no longer be helped. And yeah. the reason that you were able to pivot after the problems with your former funder is that you had a strategic vision and you were able, and you were able to understand what you needed to do. And I think that someone like me, or any other volunteer who does strategic planning can do is actually just help the organizations articulate what they really already know. So one of the things that I think is important as a volunteer is to actually be humble and know that the colleagues whom they work with are as educated, if not better educated and knowledgeable than the volunteer. And I think that is critical. The only difference is 
that sometimes one sees things differently when one comes in and doesn't have to do all the other day-to-day -day things that an executive director has to do to survive. And I think that's the other beauty is what I like about this volunteer assignment and what I like about the design is that it is executive director to executive director, that one can talk peer to peer, that Christina or Darling understands the pain that I go through running a nonprofit, might be in the United States, not in the Philippines, and I understand the pain that she's going through in the Philippines. So I urge organizations not to dismiss strategic planning, and I won't bore all the people with all the details, but to really view that as a critical component of technical assistance, including that one continuously checks in this one's counterpart so that the strategic plan can be analyzed on an annual basis. Because if we've learned anything in this last year, one has to be constantly revisiting what one is doing and ensuring that one has, can't stress it enough, enough funding to do one's mission. And I hope whoever is listening, that Friends gets lots and lots and lots of money from lots and lots of donors. You deserve it. It is Giving Tuesday, so let's hope. So thank you for this opportunity. And um, I'm very thankful that I had this chance to be a part of this. I'll stop now. Thank you, Susan, and thanks to the panelists for your presentations and for sharing really your various experiences, strength, and valuable insights. And we will continue this, this discussion, and I'll pose some questions to all of you. But we're also inviting, we have 41 participants in today's webinar, so I invite you to send in your questions via the chat box, and we'll open up the floor uh, and address uh, the questions as they come in. So please feel free to send them through. Uh, I'll start with you, Susan, Johnny, you know, based on your experiences in coaching organizations, is there a common challenge you have noted uh, by the organizations? And what are key elements in resolving some of these challenges? Susan, can I start with you? I think it's I think it's important for a volunteer. I was lucky I worked for USAID for many years. So I understand the being overseas, but I think it's important for the volunteer, whoever is chosen, to understand some of the constraints that um, one's counterpart is facing. And to step outside of one's own experience and to really listen to what the counterpart wants assistance in. And I think that is the only way this kind of relationship can work. And that one also puts all judgment aside because it, I think it is easy for one to not always understand the, you know, the, even the technological issues that a counterpart is facing, or that, um, as you mentioned in the beginning, um, Christina, that not everybody's um, English is not the first language, including for me. So that one also spends time, and I think volunteers don't do enough of it, including me to do more research on the counterpart organization. So I think it's more the question of the constraints on the volunteer versus the constraints on, or on the counterpart. I think we have to do a better job as volunteers. I think that's that for this to be successful, we have to do more work. Um, so I view, I would flip the question a bit, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Johnny, you want to add uh, to this perspective? Yes, uh, thank you, Sabrina. Uh, most of the organizations chorus about the challenge of uh, financial constraints. Uh, 
it is in forging multiple partnerships that this constraint can be duly addressed. Uh, organizing fundraising activities can also be a case step. Yet again, uh, having several stakeholders who share the same advocacy is a great help. For the case of Friend Foundation, it is the thoughts of uh, Ron Finlay, uh, one of the uh, modern day agricultural warriors, uh, had said that uh, producing your own food is like printing your own money. Uh, in the case of Friend Foundation, it is vital that uh, they intensify the current level of their uh, agricultural production as one way to uh, generate uh, funding and uh, yeah, financial resources for them to uh, forward uh, their uh, engagements. Thank you. So can I just add, I think the reason, going back to the boring strategic plan, um, it also is a communications tool to explain to potential funders what one is trying to achieve. And I think it is critical, going back to the issue of money, to be able to articulate why one is important. And that's why, for example, a strategic plan has to be well-written and one has to be able to communicate the achievements, the impact. And again, going back to the issue, if we didn't exist, what would happen? Who would take care of these people? Who would help them? What would it mean to the community? What would it mean to the country? So I think a strategic plan is the story that you need to tell, not just for your stakeholders, but to the funders. It is critical because you have to be able to articulate what you are about. Great insights, Susan and Johnny. Christina, uh, a question just came from one of our audience, Kenneth Abbott. Um, uh, the question reads, what were the unique challenges posed by COVID? How did you yourselves and the people with whom you worked with say? Okay. At the early stages, we were really strict and we have to stop operations during the COVID. We made sure that everybody gets paid in advance so that because we do not know when to go back to work. So we paid in advance and then shut down our operations. But we have uh, co-employees who are living around the training center where our farms and gardens are. So they were taking care of our office and the gardens. But when it loosened up, then from time to time, we have to go back to work. And then we had this experience that somebody contracted COVID and then, so we have to lock down again um, our offices. But we made sure that we help each other face this challenge of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So up to now, thank God we, we are surviving. And we, with the help of Grameen Foundation, we have virtual sessions. So even if there's a pandemic, as long as you know that there are organizations supporting you, helping you face this challenge, then that is very encouraging. That's why we are so grateful for this project. Thank you, darling. Susan, go back to the discussion on strategic planning and your project. We know in strategic planning work, sustainability is key. How can organizations be more sustainable? You know, what should they focus on? I know it's a fully loaded question, but can you give us your insights? Well, I think one of the most important things about a plan and to be sustainable is to collect data. Uh, and uh, Darling and I spoke a lot about it is data is critical and understanding the budget. And I think nonprofits 
don't always take into account um, all the costs associated with personnel or even a light bulb because we focus so much on mission. And I think what, and, and darling, please tell me if I'm wrong. I think we really um, figured out how much each project would cost through this um, analysis. And I think- Yeah, we did. And including hours. And I think non- Yeah, man hours, don't... man days, right. man hours, yeah. And I don't think nonprofit leaders are always trained to think that way. Um, and I think some of these um, business practices are important for nonprofits to leaders to learn and to embrace that there's nothing wrong about asking how much time does it take to do something? How much does it cost? Is the right person doing the, the job? And I think that helped us streamline also how to allocate time and effort and the right people for the various um, project buckets. But that takes time and one has to be willing to also make some um, choices. We can't do it all. And I think that's another thing we learned is that a good nonprofit leader like Darling wants to do everything for her community. And I think it's very hard to go, well, maybe I can't. And maybe I should just focus on a few things and do that really well and then do something else. And I think leaders, nonprofit leaders are so passionate that they sometimes are not willing, um, darling was, to go, let's just pare it down to four things rather than six things. I think that's something, again, darling, tell me if, if I'm wrong, but I think that's kind of where we- Yeah, yeah. you're right. But some of the projects are already existing. <laughs> And uh, we have to continue because people are expecting. Yes. But I think strategic planning makes nonprofits make hard choices. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's difficult. And, often, and sometimes just in my personal running a nonprofit, sometimes we have to cut legacy projects, even though everybody loved them but we just didn't have the money for it. And that's very painful. And, you know, it's, but one has to make these decisions to survive. And then one also has to be open going back to sustainability. One has to take risks with new potential funders. One has to be constantly looking for new people, new companies, and that takes time and effort. And Darling and I talked about it too. That also means dedicated staff time to that effort. And when one doesn't always have the money and the staff, that gets overlooked and it, it cannot be overlooked. One has to have staff to help raise money. That's my lesson I've learned through long years of in the nonprofit sector. Susan, very helpful. Let's switch it to uh, Darling on your side. I mean, I know you've, you've heard a lot of insights from Susan, from Johnny. You've mentioned um, some of the recommendations, you know, just now. And since you have other organizations listening to today, there is an impression, a continued impression that strategic and operational plans are difficult to prepare. If you had one minute, how can you convince other organizations to undergo this exercise and let it be doable and not scary? Well, we have very good volunteer experts. Susan says it's boring. I won't say it's boring, she just made it very interesting. That's why we had so many virtual sessions with her. But yeah, you're right. It could be difficult, especially now in our present situation that um, we are turning, transforming into a social enterprise development NGO. We thought we already were, but because of what they have shared, then we realize uh, we still have a lot of things to learn. It becomes doable if you really know what you want to achieve. 
That's why our volunteer experts started with the vision and mission and then value statements. So we will know and we have to accept the very purpose for which our organization is existing. Without that, then strategic planning will be very hard. We were just blessed that we have uh, volunteer experts who are so patient who is so patient with us. That's why, let me add that in strategic planning, it is, I think, important that the one who facilitates your strategic planning is not somebody who belongs to the same organization. It has to be somebody who carry a lot of experiences and expertise and a lot of patience with us. Now, as uh, they facilitate the strategic planning, our goals will be clear. And they have to, and objectives, they have to be aligned with, with our mission. That's why our mission has to really be very clear so that we can plan the right projects to the right people at the right time using the right resources and sources of funds. So that becomes easy. But again, I would say it was not easy for us. It was just made easy by the expert volunteers because they were so understanding. They accept what we are, our shortcomings. So it's important that you accept your shortcomings and do not rationalize what you've done before. One of the uh, expert volunteer told us, let the flower die, stop connecting yourself to your funder because it was so easy before. All our activities were fully funded and we were just doing what they wanted us to do. Now it's different. It's like starting from scratch. I don't know what I could have done without the assistance of the F2F project. And before I get emotional, uh, let me stop there. <laughs> Well, darling, this was a really insightful. We'll move. Um, I will shift gears to now Johnny and Susan. We have a question from the audience actually addressing um, both. What kind of challenges did you volunteers face when relying on primary information sources, sometimes not available in English? So it's a good question for Johnny uh, also to, you know, bring in your voice here. Okay, uh, let me start uh, with this question of uh, Kenneth. Well, thank you, Kenneth, but uh, with, with the availability of uh, information in Filipino and uh, Visayan uh, language. Well, I'm just I'm just blessed that somehow I am uh, flexible. I am um, linguistic, so it uh, it came easy for me to uh, digest uh, all this uh, information. Given also that um, these uh, guys from Friend Foundation, a uh, few of them are my schoolmates during my college days. So um, it was, it has become easy for me to, to translate and uh, interpret those uh, information uh, from them. Well, I understand it would be uh, difficult for uh, Susan and uh, well, I'll I'll uh, relinquish the floor to her uh, in this case. Thank you. Susan, do you want to add? So I was lucky that everything was provided in English, um, but I also trusted the data and the information that was provided to me. And I think that's important. So I think Friends Foundation has a, already a, 
a good structure in, in place and their budget figures and their data were very clear. So one could trust the information. I think that's important because as a, as a volunteer or anybody who comes in, one has to be able to use and rely on the information that is provided. And when one is dealing with an ethical counterpart that believes in transparency, it is obviously much easier because everything was provided to me. If I asked how much does the light bulb cost, darling, you tell me how much the light bulb cost. But she also more importantly was collecting the information about how much the light bulb cost. And I think that's very important. So one has to have a trusting relationship. And the good news is that Farmer to Farmer, obviously, and Grameen Foundation is choosing partners where they believe that the information is transparent and trustworthy. And that's critical. Tony, you know, a question to you. You had mentioned in your recommendations that Friend could leverage its training facilities and farm space, especially important during the pandemic now where folks prefer out space. How can an organization, you know, better leverage existing resources to better respond to the market? How can one be more dynamic? What's your experience and your insights? Johnny, you're on mute. Yes, uh, thank you, Sabrina. Uh, the Friend Foundation can uh, maximize the use of its farm through interactive uh, ecotourism. Uh, as the country prepares for the next normal, they can gradually open their farm for uh, agritourism. Then progression shall depend on how their eyes could afford to see and how their hands can handle. They have this um, dragon fruit farm. They have this uh, fish farm. They have this uh, nursery and uh, fruit farm. Uh, with all of this, the intensification of its production can, can be done. And uh, with that, practically and primarily opening it for agritourism can uh, hugely live, uh, put their resources as a leverage in furthering the progression that uh, they expect for their organization. Thank you. May I add something? <laughs> yeah, uh, that was what we thought, that we can be like independent because of how we have developed our demonstration farms at the Friend Training Center. However, like the farmers, uh, farmer clients of the bank were affected by the typhoon. We were also affected by the typhoon. Our dragon fruit plantation was flooded and then uh, infest, infected with fungus. And they're practically, we practically harvested barely one third of what we used to in the past. And because of the floods, all the fishes that we have also went with the floods. So we have these challenges. Uh, we thought we can, we can have the ecotourism and we are glad that uh, Johnny is helping us out. But the thing is we were not ready. We were not ready with the floods. They used to be just in other areas and then it came to us. So this is what uh, makes strategic planning very important. We have to have, um, Ms. Susan discussed about business continuity plan. The banks doesn't have business, con it's not only the banks who would have business continuity plans, but also us. Because uh, how would you, how would you respond to challenges like this? We are, Still, we want to be an ecotourism uh, organization, especially our center. And because of strategic planning, I know that we will be able to have solutions to those problems that are force majeure. That's it. 
So I just want to um, echo this. We talk quite a bit in our strategic planning about mm -hmm. change and um, contingency planning. And I think, you know, 10 years ago, we would, we would have probably not talked about climate change as a, a, as a driver for strategic planning. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's important that, um, that one keeps these, as you said, force majeure mm -hmm. in mind that we, we take these things into account. So strategic mm -hmm. planning now is, remember we were gonna do a 10 year plan, then we decided on five years because probably, you know, in the future, maybe two year planning is the best way to approach strategic planning rather than kind of the standard best practices of five years. Maybe that doesn't make sense anymore. It's something for all of us to think about that that is maybe an, a totally outdated model for us. Thank you, Susan. One last question, Susan Johnny. Uh, I mean, I know here in the U.S. we have Giving Tuesday, and Susan, you've mentioned it at the beginning uh, of the webinar. What are the best practices or advice you have in raising funds to head start organizations? We can start, Susan, with you, First. and Johnny will go to you. Oh, so... <laughs> The ongoing issue, um, it depends on obviously one's mission. Uh, every organization raises money differently. Some people obtain money from individual giving, some from don't, uh, corporations, some you know foundations. Oddly enough, my organization is making more money now through individual giving. So it shifted two or three years ago and it shifted and we are now making 80% of our money from very generous contributors because we learned how to articulate our mission better because we were also able to tell stories of why it matters that we exist and why we can change lives. And that took a lot of time. So we, like Darling, we had to pivot because we, we used to get money from corporations and that went away. That's why I was very attuned to Darling's dilemma because we had to figure out a totally different business model. And, but that takes time to build. And one has to be able to figure that out. So, you know, one has to also be able to take risks and also realize that not everything always works. So I call everything we do, it's a pilot initiative. I go, it's a pilot. Let's just try it. And then it works or it doesn't work, but we take risks every single day. Because one has to. Does that answer the question? Absolutely. Johnny, give us words of wisdom. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, at the outset, an, an in-depth uh, stakeholders analysis can be a great start. Knowing what your partners have and knowing what they can, what they are passionate about, is uh, as essential as uh, engaging them. The the other is uh, intervention mapping. Uh, it is an uh, effective approach in which uh, I was able to utilize this when I was with the National Anti-Poverty Commission of the uh, national government. The, the other thing is practically involving individual uh, overseas Filipino workers and uh, migrants. One, one of the approach is uh, practically the, the organization has to package the, the or share or uh, bond uh, procurement uh, approach or uh, mechanism where uh, these overseas workers or uh, Filipino migrants will be encouraged to invest into a friend foundation by procuring or purchasing stocks or uh, shares. And uh, the 
the the funds will be managed by an uh, internal internal board yet uh, uh, with with a composite uh, members from from outside uh, organizations such as or uh, the group of the Filipino workers or migrants and that uh, this these uh, funds will be provided with like uh, uh, an interest for for a certain period uh, of time and uh, yeah the, the the shareholders will be uh, encouraged to put in their uh, investments where the the Fred Foundation can uh, can invest it uh, further uh, on the in the businesses that uh, they will be planning to uh, engage. This, this is a, a very uh, good shift as well for for the Filipino workers and migrants, knowing that here in Philippines it is just but common for OFWs to simply buy a condo unit uh, just just to flaunt that uh, they are indeed having uh, investments uh, at, at some point uh, they will be uh, investing on uh, procuring vehicles which are which are not income generating but in this case if they will be encouraged to uh, divert their uh, investments into uh, production into uh, agribusiness, they know and they will be motivated that in, in five years' time, they are indeed uh, shifting themselves from being simple investors to becoming social entrepreneurs. Thank you. Johnny, for that. Thank you to the three panelists for your heartfelt presentations and your invaluable insights. Uh, Christine, I'll hand it over to you to help us close. Thank you, Sabrina, panelists and participants for the excellent discussion. I, I, I learned a lot and um, I really hope that our participants also and our audience um, come off from this event, um, picking up some pieces of advice that they can apply in the industries and organizations. As we all know, it's a challenging time across the globe, but the efforts of the volunteers uh, in putting and helping communities from another part of the world is inspiring and we hope to continue making a positive impact during uh, this pandemic, even remotely. Before we close, we'd like to recognize some of our attendees. Um, thank you so much for always supporting Farmer to Farmer and Grameen. We have our partners from Cocotec, Asian Institute of Management, Ahon Sahira, uh, my, uh, Microfinance, um, Rafi Microfinance, DTI, uh, Department of Trade and Industry, BISMED. We have also representatives from Don Bosco Agro Mechanical Technology Center, uh, you are U.S. volunteers, new and upcoming volunteers. Thanks you for sharing your time with us. Our household multi-purpose cooperative, and our other um, representatives from the local donor community and um, our international partners. Welcome and thank you so much again. Uh, we hope that you were able to gain uh, some insights again from our efforts through the Farmer to Farmer program, especially during, during this time. Uh, hang in there, folks, and stay tuned for updates and information about our next webinar. So we will continue to have these sessions all throughout next year. And a recording of today's webinar will be made available and will be sent to all participants um after the call um so watch out for an email from us for more information about the available projects uh, please visit bankerswithoutborders.com slash volunteer or you can send us an email at gf underscore f2f at grameenfoundation.org and also visit us on facebook by typing fb.com slash grameen bwb on behalf of the Farmer to Farmer Caucus, thank you for staying with us and hope you keep safe and have a great rest of your day and rest of your evening. And thank you everyone. And thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you very much.